Hi, everybody. My name is Mike Hoskins. It's a special joy for me to be here with you today. As you may have heard, I graduated from BG. It's a bit deeper than that. I grew up in Bowling Green, went to high school here and college here. My dad was a professor on the faculty here in the College of Business for over 20 years, so I've got a special affection for Bowling Green. It's always uh, nice to come back, and frankly, over the last couple of years, amazing to come back and see the strides that BGSU has made. It's very, uh, very impressive. Uh, my title is CTO at Pervasive Software. Pervasive is a publicly traded software company. Uh, the CTO is the chief technology officer, which if you're a technologist like I am, is the ideal job in the universe because you get to think a lot about uh, the future, uh, about how Pervasive and other companies can innovate. What are the big trends? Where uh, is the world of computing and software that I play in? But the world at large, if you're a chief technologist, you have to worry about very large multi-year trends. And one of the hottest trends in my industry right now is what we call big data. Uh, this is data like you know data, what you store on your computers or what you upload to your, to your Facebook accounts. And today we're going we're gonna to take a dive into big data and, and see uh, how it's going to change your world in ways that you can't uh, even imagine today. So I threw up a quote from uh, Eric Schmidt up until recently. Eric was the CEO of uh, Google. Of course, they know a lot about data, probably have the largest server farms in the world. I think I saw the other day that they consume already something like 2 or 3 or 4% of the electricity uh, in the United States just to feed their server farms. It's quite amazing. He knows a lot about data, and this quote uh, is stunning. Uh, the, the, the people who are in the industry have been caught a bit flat-footed, and the big data uh, revolution has really, uh, really provoked some angst uh, inside the industry, certainly in the hardware guys, and absolutely in the software industry where I play. And so we're wrestling with, uh, with what it means. How do, we, how do we solve it? But first, uh, some background that might help you uh, understand what's going on. The internet, of course, was uh, a fairly recent introduction, only in the 90s, the most important uh, platform for information, content, creation, storage, and retrieval ever since 1450, Gutenberg with the printing press. I mean, it is, it is hard to stress how massively the internet, which was invented in most of our lifetimes, how massively it will change. Uh, all of our lives. It augured in a period that I like to call the conversion from the analog age to the digital age. Uh, the analog age is what we've lived in for hundreds, even thousands of years. I will tell you a funny story. When I first got to Bowling Green, I was a computer science major for a year, and then I, I had a funny conversation with my dad one day, and he said, uh, isn't that really good? And I said, you know, Dad, I don't think this computer thing is going anywhere. I'm going to change to the College of Business. <laughs> so I did, and I changed my major to finance. And I was going to be an investment banker, and here I ended up in, uh, in technology, as it turns out. But I was keen about finance, and I was reading the Wall Street Journal every day, and I was going to invest my first $500, so I wanted to make some stock trades. And So how do you make a stock trade? This is 1974. Uh, well, you have to find a broker. It's not like a bunch of them in Bowling Green. There was no, no internet, no online trading. So I got in a car, and I drove up to Kidder Peabody, a long defunct broker, a guy named Jim Hackley up in Toledo, and I sat at his little desk, and we hatched my first trade, and he took out his pencil and wrote it on a piece of paper, and I can't quite remember, but I think he clipped it onto a zip wire and went zing, and some little guy with a green eye shade over there caught it and started tapping on the Morse code, saying, New York, New York, we have an order. I mean, it wasn't quite that primitive, but it was close. Now, I'm a very active trader still, uh, and trading has been revolutionized in just my lifetime. I now click one button on my keyboard, I can buy and sell anything in the world. And you know what? There's no humans between me and the trade. It goes immediately through N layers of software all the way to exchanges. I mean, they have a few for TV open outcry trading exchanges still. But by and large, all trades are now brokered by big, big computers. In fact, uh, the trading volumes on the New York Stock Exchange back then were a few millions of shares a day because humans were doing them, the analog world. Uh, we shifted to the digital world, and we now do billions and billions and billions of trades just on the New York Stock Exchange alone around the world every day, just staggeringly high volumes of digital data events. You know what else is kind of interesting about that? 70% of all trades on the New York Stock Exchange are done by computers, not even by humans anymore. So what's called algorithmic trading, software and algorithms decide what to buy and sell. This is a monumental shift that we are living through in our lifetimes, from an utterly analog universe to an utterly digital universe, and there's no going back. So how big is this big data, this digital data that we create every day? Uh, we store it on our computers. We upload it to the cloud. 
Uh, you can see a little graphic here. Uh, last year, we created 800,000 petabytes of new data. How big is a petabyte? It's 1,000 terabytes, so that's 800,000 petabytes is 800 million terabytes. It's a lot of data. The really scary thing about this graph is the trajectory of that upward line. Uh, there is no end in sight. We are in year one or two of the big data revolution where we are going to capture data volumes that the world has never seen. So how big is, is 800,000 petabytes or a petabyte? This is the academic part of the presentation. This is where you have to learn something. Actually, if nothing else, you can learn a couple of, of cool phrases and you can wow your friends at the parties. If you jump ahead, you can see what comes after terabytes there are petabytes, exabytes, zettabytes, and yottabytes. So there's some real cachet that you can use to throw those out. I, I was furnished once a, a quick explanation that helped me understand the gaps between megabytes and gigabytes. Most of us buy stuff that are in the gigabytes, the flashcards, maybe terabytes for hard disks uh, in our desktop machines. These are pretty big volumes of data already. Let's say they were units of time. Let's say it was a second in a day. So we know how fast a second is. How long is a megasecond, a million seconds? Well, I did the math for you, saved you the trouble. It's about 11 days. So a megasecond, a million seconds, about 11 days. How long is a gigasecond? You know, we throw around words like megabyte and gigabyte like they're kind of like each other. Gigabyte's a lot bigger than a megabyte. How long is a gigasecond, a billion seconds? If a megasecond is 11 days, it's 30 years. That's a big jump. And then there's a terasecond, a trillion seconds. And we throw away, you know, the, how many gigabytes or how many terabytes you got like it's just nothing. If a gigasecond is 30 years, a terasecond is 32,000 years ago before we started recording history even. And that's just terascale computing. Then we have petascale computing and exascale computing. These are really, really big data volumes. So the question is, where did all this big data come from? If we're facing an avalanche of digital data events uh, that are being created everywhere around the world, where did it come from? Well, I've got some ideas there that help you. Uh, mobile is a big one. I mean, 20 years ago, we didn't really have Mobile devices, I read the other day that there's something like three or four billion mobile devices in the world today. That's incredible. People like China Mobile, the telecommunications company in China, has 200 million, 300 million, 400 million subscribers. They each send 10 texts a day. That's four billion text messages in one day, multiplied by days and weeks, and then they're using it as a camera and uploading pictures. It's just off the charts, and you can see some of the numbers there. That's terabytes per month. Hard to do that. That would be petabytes, and they're already in exabytes. What are those? Quintillions of bytes? Just in a single month, just for mobile devices. And there's the traditional internet that we know so well. Things like credit card transactions, they're skyrocketing. I talked about financial transactions, they're skyrocketing. And Facebook, I, I read the other day that three billion pictures are uploaded to Facebook every month. That's now. In three years, it'll be 30 billion. We, we are on the thin edge of an enormously scary wedge around huge data creation. But that's not even the real culprit. The real culprit is this next one, an Internet of Things. So far, the Internet's been largely uh, experience for humans. They create the content, they store it, they retrieve it. The players that are starting to participate on the Internet are machines. I'll give you an example. Uh, read about a company in Austin, Texas, where I live, uh, who was doing... Uh, some people, small business, and they did uh, temperature measurement equipment, so machines to measure temperatures. And they lived in the analog universe, and they would measure the temperature in a body of water or down a wellhead, and they would drop a cable down there, and they would have their little analog devices with their little mercury thermometers or whatever they were doing, their little gauges going blah, 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 back and forth, and maybe every 100 yards they could measure with some degree of accuracy the temperature uh, in that wellhead or across that body of water. Well, recently they innovated. They went to a digital world. They now measure down a wellhead or across a body of water with a piece of cable that's entirely digital where the information on it is transferred uh, over fiber optics, which means their world has changed forever. They can now measure across a body of water or down a tunnel an infinite amount of data points. Instead of every 100 yards, they can have it every meter. They can have it every centimeter. They can have a measurement every millimeter, every tenth of a millimeter, every billionth of a millimeter. And because they can, they will. And they don't only measure it every hour, they measure it every minute, every second, every tenth of a second, every hundredth of a second. Because they can, and they will. And they actually, they get more accurate data, and they make better decisions if they have that. 
And so just from that one illustration, you can see how the volume of data is just exploding. I visited General Electric the other day, uh, the jet engine team. Uh, they told me that a modern day jet engine from General Electric uh, has 15,000 sensors in it, one engine. Every sensor is recording information every second. In a few years, there'll be 150,000 sensors, and they're recording information every hundredth of a second. That's just one jet engine. These are, you know, in a world where we're instrumenting the universe, these are almost living information devices that are constantly alive and constantly collecting information and constantly sending it somewhere. Where? And so that's what the big data revolution is all about. I mean, think of something simple like your house. How do we read our meter? in our house. I mean, for hundreds of years, or certainly decades, we've had the analog universe of meter reading, which means we send a human in there and they kind of grope around and dig through the bushes and get to the side of your house where the meter is. And there's that analog little circle going around and around and they measure it accurately 90% of the time and inaccurately and by the time it gets back and entered in the office, it gets entered inaccurately again. And so we have all of the costs of being able to maybe measure it once a month with some risk on accuracy. Well, that's not true anymore. Your house is on the internet. Your house is a machine. The smart grid and smart energy is all about having that be an internet device. There's no human that goes out there anymore to read the meter. That meter's alive all the time. That meter is talking to the cloud all the time, which means you can measure the electricity usage in your house not just once a month, but once a day, once an hour, once a minute, once a second. And because they can, they will. In fact, that gives you better information, gives their better information for billing, you better information for management. But it's not just the house anymore. There are machines in the house, refrigerators. Refrigerators are soon to be internet devices. There'll be 10 motors in a refrigerator. Every motor will be communicating back with its energy usage every tenth of a second. And so that entire house becomes this information machine that is spewing out billions and billions and billions of digital data events every day. And you multiply that by all the machines. These are called sensor networks. All the machines in the world that are kicking out this volume of data. And that's what the big data revolution is about. So, what to do with all this big data? The answer is really easy. Uh, we analyze it. Uh, as I said before, we're monitoring the universe in real time. It's almost like we have our finger on the digital pulse of what's going on. But these are very, very large volumes of data. And our traditional ways to do analysis depended pretty heavily on humans. But these volumes are so large that human science and human modeling is not really working. Uh, anymore. And besides, who knows what's in there? It's not just a question of looking back and seeing how many widgets we sold last Thursday. It's, a, it's looking for undiscovered patterns in these mountains of data and, and interesting correlations because we've collected all the data for the first time at this level of granularity and it's in one place. And so we can do discovery that's never been possible before. And so analytics is something you'll often hear together with big data. And I predict this will hit all of you. Big data analytics. But if humans can't do it, how are we going to do it? We're going to do it with machine learning techniques. And I hazard a guess that most of you are very unfamiliar with the terms on here. Uh, they've been larger the province of special scientists. Bowling Green has a renowned program in advanced statistics and a couple of colleges here. They're, if those folks are in the room, they understand these words very well. Uh, but this is the emerging science that's going to be important. If these are, are huge mountains of data and they have gold veins in there. They have incredible information, but we have to mine that data out of there. In fact, that science is called data mining. Then, yeah, we're going to have to do some kind of new deep analytics on these big data mountains. Uh, why do we do it? One is to augment reality and improve decision making. I think most of you know applications like Shazam and Google Goggles. These are, these are, I mean, we use them and I think don't really appreciate how game-changing they are. It'll only be a couple of years in the future when we're walking around with devices like this or eyeglasses or your shirt button collar or the earring in your ear that'll have the ability to be a camera and watch the world in real time, just like Shazam can listen to music in real time. It'll be watching. You'll be walking through a cocktail party and somebody will come up against you. You don't even know who they are, but you will know who they are because the camera's watching them and through advanced pattern recognition and face recognition software, they say, oh, that's Joe. Joe's Married to Jane, they have two kids, uh, Bob and Ralph, and Ralph just broke his ankle in the soccer match. And you say, hey, Joe, how's the wife, and how's the kid just broke his ankle in the soccer match? It's just, and you'll know where they went to lunch that day because they have geolocation, and they check in on their mobile device. And, and, and this, this mountain of data is going to be at your disposal in ways that we just can't even appreciate today. This is called uh, augmented reality because the traditional analog reality is the one that we inhabit. But probably the big, big idea 
in big data analytics is predicting the future. If you really collected all the data, you'd be able to see things that nobody's ever been able to see before. And you'd be able to make predictions about the future. And we know what this space is like. We all have credit scores, the FICO score. That's a predictor of whether we're going to pay our debts or not. But it's a very primitive science to, compared to what's coming. And the Netflix prize was a million dollars if they could improve their recommender algorithm by 10%. It is enormously important to businesses to be able to predict the future. They would win. Who are the good customers? Who are the bad customers? Who's going to buy? Who's going to churn away? Is it a good guy? Is it a bad guy? Governments care. Everybody cares. And so being able to predict the future. You know, like I said, I live in Austin. My AC went out the other day, uh, which is a bad thing in Austin when it's August and it's 105 degrees every day. Uh, I thought about that. You know, 50 years from now, people are going to laugh at the primitive state of the world that we lived in. In a big data world, that air conditioner would itself be a sensor network with hundreds of sensors recording everything all the time, not only to feed the billing machine at the energy company, but to feed the background information so that the people who build those machines can look at all the historical data and see which motor failed when this temperature gauge sensor passed these two standard deviations. And they'll know that in advance, and they'll send me an email two weeks before it breaks and say, your AC is probably going to break because you show this pattern of data that nobody's, you know, every time we've ever seen in the past, the AC breaks. So this is a big deal. It's going to change the world for all of us. What does it mean to you? I'll leave you with one thought. I think there are students in the room. It's probably more relevant to them. Uh, but there's going to be a new science emerging, certainly if you're a technologist, and I think even outside of technology, they call these people data scientists, data artisans. If you look at this graph, and maybe we share these presentations later, and if you look down in the lower right-hand corner, you'll see uh, some things, uh, 140,000, 190,000 new positions, talent positions. Statistics is the new sexy degree. If you can crunch big data, then you will be a very, very powerful uh, position. So that's uh, my contribution for today. Big data is right now in the province of technologists like me, but it's very, very important. And I encourage you, certainly the students who are in the audience, uh, to take a look at this space and understand something about data mining and predictive analytics and big data. Thank you very much.